Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Something special is happening. You are invited to join us on Saturday, July 13th for a live podcast recording, Jung's American Muse, Christiana Morgan's Visions and Art. Our guest will be Christiana Morgan's granddaughter, the filmmaker Hilary Morgan. Hilary will share intimate memories of her grandmother, who, as a gifted and beautiful young artist, was one of the most important women to shape Jung's ideas of the feminine principle in psychology. Her visions and art illuminated the unconscious in ways he had never imagined. Together, we'll watch Hillary's extraordinary documentary, Tower of Dreams, and after our discussion, the audience can ask questions. Click the link below to purchase your ticket at the small cost of $5. We hope to see every one of you there. Today on the podcast, we have a special treat. We are so happy to welcome uh, the the artist, art therapist, Jungian analyst, our kid training, our kid brother in training, who was right behind us, and our dear friend and colleague, Mark Dean, who is also current president of the Philadelphia Association of Jungian Analysts. So welcome, Mark. We're going to be talking today about art and psyche. And I'm wondering if you could sort of just give us your your resume a little bit. Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about yourself? Sure, sure. Be happy to. And thank you for having me, by the way, to all of you. Um, probably the best way for me to, to, to explain myself would be to tell you a little bit about my, my life path and my trajectory. Mm. Um, you know, looking back from a very early age, um, I had a, an intimation of the importance of uh, imagery or the intertwinement of imagery and, and matters psychological. Um, in the home that I grew up with in Indianapolis, um, my father had books on the bottom shelf. He had Freud, he had Jung, and he also mm. had all the art books there. Mm. And so um, uh, he was, uh, right. he was a, a wonderful man in many ways and, and certainly... Um, encouraging of my art so that uh, I, I became sort of the high school artist you know there were the jocks and the intellectuals and there were the artists and I was one of the high school artists and and I decided that uh, really what I wanted to do when I went off to college was to study art and also study psychology so I applied to the Rhode Island School of Design and I was intending to go to Brown University to study psychology and got to RISD and got swept up in the art and uh, in hindsight, I'm really glad that I did. I think that that was the centerpiece. I think you know, imagery certainly is the centerpiece of psychology, as you'll as you'll find out as we go mm. along and talk more. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, once I graduated, I went to the uh, Queens College and got an MFA in painting, and went on to have an art career um, in the New York uh, East Village scene <laughs> in the '80s, and. Um, uh, in many ways, even though I was pursuing what I thought would be the dream that any art student would want, success in the art field, uh, uh, exhibiting career, um, I was in many ways unhappy. And I remember one night waking up, uh, I had been doing uh, volunteer work at a home for children. These were children that had been dropped off by their parents. They weren't capable of caring oh for God. them. And I remember being uh, downstairs in the basement of that place doing art with the kids and teaching them guitar. And uh, there were some other art materials Mm. around there. And I asked one of the kids, hey, what's this stuff? And he said, oh, that's the art therapist lady. And I went, bing, art therapy. So that really rang a bell for me because that was a return to that old old connection. And uh, much to the uh, uh, bewilderment 
of all of my friends in the art world, because uh, I was doing well, um, I left it and mm -hmm. enrolled in an art therapy program. I didn't think they'd accept me, but they did. And so I began a career, a uh, second career, got a, a, a second master's in art therapy and uh, began to practice as an art therapist. And can I, uh, can, I, can I slow you down for just a second? Sure. Because, um, Mark, I mean, when did we first meet? I mean, it must be 15 years ago, something like that. I mean, it's, I've known yeah. you for a while. Yeah. And, and someone, I can't remember who, you know, said, did you, you know, did you know Mark Dean was really successful as an artist? And I, I heard, I've heard these rumors and I've always wanted to mm -hmm. ask you about it, but I just never have. Can, can you say a little bit more about your career as an artist and, and yeah. the success that you found there? I'd, I'd like to give you an opportunity to, to Well, it's to a wow, really interesting wow story. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a really interesting story. Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. not, not because it's about myself, just because psychologically it makes sense. Um, I did get swept up in doing the art, and I was trying to do all this heroic art that I thought would win me praise and success in the art world. Well, and what's heroic art? What, what, what do you mean um, heroic well, art? Well, it, it was pretty much what the art heroes of the period were doing. And there were large okay. paintings. They were these abstractions and so forth. And um, <laughs> at some point, I finally kind of gave up on that, and I settled down into this, these small little narrative paintings that I, was, mm. I would chuckle as I did them. I was like laughing mm. as I was doing these things and thinking to myself, no one will ever take this stuff seriously. Well, lo and behold, we have a, mm. a, a, um, a studio visit by um, a guy by the name of Ned Rifkin, who was... Um, uh, a curator with a, a, a big museum. And he came and, and he looked at my artwork and he loved it. And so he had all these collectors come to my art studio to visit and they loved my artwork. And the next thing uh. you know, I'm getting this, this call from this gallerist in New York City, which I don't understand because I'm thinking, this is just fun stuff to do. How can anybody quite take this seriously? But I think in hindsight, um, you know, I think we can understand that, that, that you get a vision of what you're supposed to be. Yeah. And then finally you discover what's really your voice, right? And that's what happened. But it, and that was bewildering too, because I was being chauffeured around in limousines by millionaires and people were talking wow. about, you know, showing at the Whitney and stuff like this. And oh. uh, uh, one of the things at the end of my career, <laughs> I get, I get, a call from you know my to die for uh, gallerist gallery owner who who was up uptown, wow. and I go in to see her, and she said, "Can you have a show this fall in London and New York?" And I heard myself say yes, but inwardly I could hear the no. I can't <laughs> wow. do this. You know? Oh my god! So uh, I can give you the image. Actually, as long as we're talking about imagery, the imagery mm -hmm. was that my art was like a fine little sailboat that I needed to sense the wind with very carefully and guide myself. And what yeah. I was in was a gale, you know? I remember oh. that image very, mm. very profoundly. And that's when I, I left, you know? Um, applied to yeah. a, wow. a school in Philadelphia to study art therapy. But um, with the art therapy, um, I learned, uh, I was trained uh, sort of psychoanalytically in art therapy. Uh, it was Hahnemann University at the time. They were very uh, psychoanalytic. And I found it very, very valuable. Uh, but then when I began to practice, um, I really began to find that the lens that I had been taught was far narrower than the material I was witnessing and the things that were happening. Uh -huh. And uh, that and a few other life events that sort of struck me as uh, coming from a direction that I didn't quite understand, um, somehow or another, and I don't really know how I made this shift, but I, I uh, got online and I started looking up Jung because I'd, I'd, uh, mm. I'd, I'd known something about Jung. I knew that I resonated with it. And that just opened this door. And uh, as you guys all know, uh, having been in the <laughs> seminar, yeah. That was like coming back to life for me. Mm. Uh, that How old was were like, you at that point, Mark? Oh, gosh. <laughs> You're asking me to give you numbers, not my strong suit. <laughs> I, was, uh, 
I think uh, in my 30s, mm -hmm. yeah, 30, 35, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first person I talked to when I called uh, um, the Philadelphia Association of Jungian Analysts was a gentleman by the name of Alden Josie. Oh, oh my gosh. Who later become my analyst. Right. And I, I went to the first seminar, and he was, he was uh, giving the seminar. And the seminar was called The Psychology of the Miraculous. Oh. And the, the assignment was to read the four Gospels. Mm -hmm. Well, I was brought up Catholic, went to Catholic school. The idea of reading the four Gospels made my head spin and wanted me to just mm -hmm. vomit. <laughs> I, was, I had been, I had been you, know, you know, beaten up by the nuns who saw me as a sinner and you know, shoved a lot of things down my throat that were... Mm -hmm. And um, we got into the room, and I think some of you might have been there, actually. I was there. I remember yeah. that assignment and thinking, yeah. oh, my God, you can't just read all four Gospels. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I did. I, I did, too, but it made my head spin because yeah. it's, it's so dense that yeah. I, my eyes could go over the words, but absorbing it, is, that's a whole other process. Yes, and uh, you may remember this, but I certainly do. <laughs> I walked out of that room floating. <gasps> Alden opened up those Gospels, and what he focused on was the miracles. In, in, and no one had yeah. ever told me yeah. that that was in those mm -hmm. texts. No one had ever showed me uh, the richness that's wow. in the Bible. You know? And this was no. a specialty of Alden's. Alden is now deceased, unfortunately. and. Uh, you know, Alden, Alden, Alden showed me something that has been very profound in my life. He showed me that, that you, you, you don't want to look at things in a preconceived way, but to open mm. yourself up to what's actually mm. there. And he did that no, with Mark, the can Gospels. I, can I just and interject totally for a second? Sure. Um, mm -hmm. I remember I had been interested in Jung. I'd been reading Jung and Jungians for a number of years. Then we moved to Philadelphia. I started the Philadelphia Seminar. September of 2000. And I remember the first seminar. It's so funny that you said that you floated out of there because I felt like I floated home. I, yeah. I, I had a walk home and I felt like I floated the whole way. It was so remarkable. Yeah. It was such a powerful experience. So I, I don't even remember who presented, but it was, it may have been um, Georgette, but mm -hmm. um, it was just so powerful anyway. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It was, it was very much a, uh... It was very much an ugly duckling experience, you know. Mm. Oh, All these that's... years, I, I thought, what I'm seeing can't possibly be real. This can't possibly be the way it oh. is. And oh. when he opened this material up and showed what was inside of it, I kind of went, oh, yeah, it's always been there. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, it makes, my, makes me tear up a bit to remember Alden. Yeah. And he was such a gifted teacher. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he did. He just opened it up. And then uh, time after time, I think we were all just blown away. Uh, it was yeah. there all the time, ready to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it took someone to open it for us. And that's what I think you're going to do for us and with us and with our listeners today is to open up things that we see all the time. Mm -hmm. But we don't know that we see what we see. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. I remember, I think it was Jim Hollis that came in one time and said, there's another world and it's right here. You know? Mm -hmm. you know? And he's, he's right. You know? yeah. And, and yes. this really has yeah. set me. I remember being in this seminar and asking the question, what happened to us as a people that we've forgotten our connection with all this stuff? You know, what happened with religion that it became what it was? What happened when people no longer could trust their inner worlds and their inner images? How did that get severed, you know? And I've, I've spent a long time actually trying to answer those questions um, and looking at those, those issues. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I've gotten to the bottom of it, but I've, in the journey, I, I just keep bumping into massively intelligent people that have said over and over again, yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, there are these multiple levels to us 
that uh, our civilization has cut us off from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is such a great question of how did we get cut off from this and what are we even talking about? Are we talking about psychic imaging? Are we, what are we talking about? Uh, what have we been cut off from and how do we reconnect with that? Well, you know, I have a lot of stories about that. I could probably talk your ear off for a lifetime. Oh, go for um, it. Well, let me just give you a little <laughs> bit of an anecdote. Um, and I, I do have some, some ideas about that and ways to articulate that. So mm -hmm. I'll try to get to those as we go along. Um, I was teaching art therapy. I taught art therapy for about 35 years. Wow. And my experience was this. I could walk into a room of students, undergraduate students, who had never done any art therapy, had never really looked at an image from any kind of critical perspective. I could put the image of a client up on the wall, and I could just let them go to town to, with it to notice what they were noticing. And I can guarantee you, because I did it over and over again, that within 15 minutes they had told us volumes about who this individual was that they had never even met. Mm. The wow. problem wow. was that they couldn't trust it. They couldn't mm -hmm. trust that they were seeing what they were seeing. Now, if you, and I know you guys have, if you open up Jung's volume five, this is what Jung's doing. He's looking at Miss Miller's fantasies and he's taking them into him and he's finding out what they're telling him from within. And this is an innate human capability. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. not necessarily an inquired skill. People can do it readily. The problem mm -hmm. is, is they've been educated not to trust it and not to believe wow. what's in them. Wow. You know, you know I, I just want to share that... Um, you know, we have people write to us after we interpret their mm -hmm. dreams on the podcast. Not all the time, but mm -hmm. but sometimes. Mm -hmm. And they they real they really say, you know, how did you know I had a trauma history? Mm -hmm. How did you how did you get all of the how mm -hmm. did you know this, this, yeah. and this from my dream? It was you know, some people are are very moved by what, what their dreams reveal. So I think you're that's yeah. I love that, Mark. That we we yeah. all know it and yet we've been educated not to trust it. I, I thank you for that. Yeah, there, there are reasons for that, specific reasons, and, and I don't want to get elaborate and, and, and esoteric and intellectual, but I've, I've, of recent years, I've really been uh, very interested, not just in Jung, but the work of Jean Gebser. And uh, Jean Gebser was a poet um, 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 and uh, uh, kind of a philosopher, and he studied language very carefully, and he began to realize that there were different structures in our psyches. Uh, he doesn't say it. He says structures of consciousness. Jung talks about different structures of the, of the psyche. Many people who are familiar with Jung will remember his dream where he descends through this building and down into a cavern where he mm -hmm. finds mm -hmm. two skulls. And I think this was on the trip back over from the Clark lectures or whatever with mm -hmm. Sigmund Freud. And Freud says, well, you have a death wish against me. And Jung says, no, I'm actually discovering that we have many, many levels within us that go right back. Well, Gebser says the same thing. He says, uh, his book is The Ever-Present Origin, which will tell you something about what the mm. content is, that all of that which we have inherited as human beings has not gone away. But what has happened is it has become sort of covered over. And it, it gets covered over by the immediately reigning uh, perspective of consciousness. And in our era, um, rationalism, materialism is really uh, the dominant mode, and its expression is science. And science says that what is, what's, what is scientifically true is the only truth. Now, it is the nature of human consciousness for that to happen. Actually, that happens in complexes as well. When a person is in a complex, one aspect of consciousness is taken over, and the others just have no say. So uh, there, this is a tendency in human awareness that we can get possessed by a particular viewpoint to the point that we find any other viewpoint relatively inaccessible. And certainly as a society, and Jung says this over and over and over mm -hmm. again in the collected works, the collectivization of who we are yeah. Uh, becomes an impediment 
to really accessing uh, the depth of who we actually are. Hmm. Say a little more about collectivization of of sure. who we are, of how do we get collectivized, mm-hmm. um, taken yeah. over by what exactly? Well, I think in some ways, you know, the anecdote that I gave you earlier about mm-hmm. my art career, um, the idea that uh, based on my exposure to the art world, and the values of my peers and what was showing in the galleries, I was adapting myself to what was expected of me as an artist, Uh, uh. right? And uh, that happens with all of us. Uh, The great great, uh, um, um, historian Harari, who writes the book uh, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, massively intelligent Mm man, uh, says, uh, most people don't want to admit it, but we all exist in myths. Uh, pre-existing myths, you know, and that most of our lives are actions in service to that myth. Now, many of your listeners, I suppose, uh, I'm I'm pretty sure, uh, will be understanding of the concept that a materialist society that believes that nature is something to be exploited uh, is having the negative effect of creating climatological disaster because Mm -hmm, there's actually mm -hmm. no actual connection to nature. There's a domination of it. And so this is, this is the problem. You see, people have been living in this materialist myth that begins really with the Enlightenment. Uh, primarily, it gets going. And Gebser would say that it is the domination of what he calls the mental structure of consciousness. Um, the mental structure of consciousness is a, a structure of consciousness that orients towards exteriority or towards the external and mm-hmm. physical world. Uh, Mm -hmm. The prior structures of consciousness oriented towards being embedded in nature. The actual value of a myth is not whether it's scientifically or factually true, but Mm -hmm. actually whether it provides a livable context. So its authenticity has to do with its utility. I'm I'm paraphrasing Milton Scarborough now uh, from a text called Myth and Modernity. So what I'm trying Mm -hmm. to articulate here is that Uh, We have different ways of knowing how to be in the world. But the current dominant, uh, the reigning reigning king, is this notion of scientific uh, uh, awareness, factuality, materiality, which has really come at the cost of our connection to our interior worlds. I'd like to make one other comment about that, if I might, because I think it's an important comment. Gebser also brings up this notion of an integrality. And what he says is that the apogee of human consciousness development isn't scientism, isn't materiality, but actually the integration of all the former structures of consciousness and ways of mm-hmm. understanding nature, our inner worlds, and the external world uh, as embodied in an individual. I think this is very close to what we mean by individuation. Yeah. So, Mark, in your work in a consulting room, how do you facilitate that process of individuation with mm-hmm. the primacy of image? Sure. Because one of the things that I notice, even with my own analysis, that Many people will come in, they're very facile with their words. Mm -hmm. Uh, Perhaps they don't even remember their dreams that frequently. Mm -hmm. But when we try to nudge into the visual imagination, or even asking them a a little bit about their fantasies, it's as if there's a sentinel at the gate (laughs) Mm. (laughs) that makes it it really difficult. Or at least, even if it's not difficult for them to experience it, perhaps it's difficult for them to say it. Yeah. So how do you negotiate this sentinel at the gate? That's a great question, Joseph. Mm. I think first and foremost for me is, uh, and you know, I've been through enough analysis <laughs> and I have had the experience, and I think that's one of the things why we go through so much analysis and training is because if it's real for us, we have a foundation in it. 
Mm. Um, I like what Jung has to say in the transcendent function, that the analyst mediates the transcendent function, meaning that the analyst has to have within him or her the capacity to span between worlds, or else the analyzan is never going to achieve that. Mm. So there, there may be lots of mm. impediments uh, for people um, to, to find ways to access that in themselves. But the first and foremost, my answer to your question would be, the analyst has to be um, aware that the psyche is always purposive. And so uh, whatever is manifesting then is part of psyche's plan and part of psyche bringing image forward in a guiding way. Um, now, one of the things when we talk about, oh, I'm sorry, did you want to? Yeah, you know, I want to, this is so rich, Mark, and, I, and please don't lose where you were, but just to mm. expand on what you were just saying, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, first of all, can, can we talk about kind of what the transcendent function is? We've certainly thrown that term around on the podcast, but it might be good to try to uh, yeah. make that more explicit for people. And also, I'm just, I'm just thinking about how I love that kind of vision of what the analyst's job is because it's it's not directive right it's sitting with the possibilities that come up yes. from the unconscious and being open yes. to that so can you just or, or maybe we can all work on sort of defining the transcendent function and maybe how that even happens in the consulting room sure i'll give some of my perspective which is incomplete uh Mm -hmm. uh, like yourselves, every I've read that essay <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot of yeah. times, and every time I read it, you know, I look at my highlights, and 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 then I realize, I, yeah, pretty much have the whole thing highlighted uh, because almost every <laughs> word is is profound, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And this really dovetails with so many things. You, you're going to get me started here, and I won't stop. Um, <laughs> but I'll try. Great stuff. So don't stop. Um, we become divided. In the process of adaptation, we become divided against our natures. We accentuate certain aspects of ourselves, and we push away other aspects of ourselves. Mm -hmm. But all of those things are part of ourselves. They are par part of our faculties. And in the neurotic uh, formulation, an individual will have a conscious identification with certain contents and disidentify with other contents, and this sets up a conflict in the psyche. Um, mm -hmm. It is for the analyst, however. Uh, Jung uses the term unconscious. I sometimes chafe at that. Uh, it, is, it is unconscious, um, but I actually find with most of my analysands that they, they know yeah. what this other aspect of themselves is. They just don't know what it's about or how mm -hmm. to relate to it. So I have to be the interpreter in a way. I have to take it seriously. I have to draw their attention to it. Because in that conflict uh, between those things, the analyst is going to hold to the veracity, the authenticity, the, um, the absolute necessity from, life, from the point of life um, that, that what is challenging the ego's assumption about itself is also has a say, that the unconscious or this other aspect also has a say. Mm -hmm. Now, this all gets very interesting. Because as I mentioned before with Gene Gebser, and I think in Jung it's very, very clear, and I think if you take the two and put them together, you really realize that they have a very mm. common map, that the two parts of the psyche don't speak the same language. Mm -hmm. you know? yep. they don't, right. you know, um, and so it's important for the analyst to be able to, to do everything you can yeah. to try to take what this other unconscious part is saying and take it seriously and not dismiss it and try to divine what it is it's trying to express. Mm. And so that effort, this is what Jung says, he says, you know, uh, the analyst's role is to, is to mediate the transcendent function, meaning that your growth as an analyst, your per growth in perception, your capacity to be open to, to something new that you've never seen before is a vital aspect of the analytic process. My client, or my analysand, uh, uh, doesn't see it. But I need to, as best I can. As best I can. So in the transcendent function, there is a coming together of these two things. 
Now, what becomes difficult about that is that typically I find an alizan say, well, I'll take this side of me and I'll take that side of me and I'll do a little bit of both and put them together and I'll figure this out. I've never seen it work that way. <laughs> what I see is that something that you could not have foreseen shows up as if out of nowhere. Yes. You know? And, and Jung says yeah. this. I mean, he mm -hmm. says, you know, you, you, you don't know what the creative outcome of this is going to be. However, speaking as, as we're talking about art and imagery and psyche, the creative function in human beings mm -hmm. is that function. It's the capacity. Yes. That doesn't mean you have to be an artist. It doesn't mean you have to play a violin or do drawings or anything like that. You know? So uh, just to give you an example, Joseph, of, of kind of a way that I might work with that, you know, I will in my work. Uh, 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 hold on, there's another thing that I think maybe I should say that might mm -hmm. help to kind of organize this. Image isn't something that we have before us. We're in it. We're in it at the same time we look at it. Mm, so when we that. think of image, we think of a picture. But we are living these dramas. This is what, mm -hmm. this is what Harari is talking about. Yeah. Right? Our, our, our lives are dramatic enactions of, of our life's drama, of our development, and of the archetypal powers. Uh, this is something that Nathan Schwartz Salant uh, nailed, I think, more beautifully than anybody I know. He says, each of our lives are individually lived, but they're actually a drama of greater powers lived through us. Uh. You know? And so what's going on in, uh, in a case, even if somebody doesn't have a dream, the drama of their life can be read like a book. It can be read like a painting. And you can look sure. at the components of it and realize the drama and the image world that they are caught in, right? So, um, and these things will show up. And sometimes what I will do is I will move from the rational world. Okay, let's just say, you know, somebody has, um, you know, something going on in them that's a feeling that... Um, uh, that they don't want and they have no relationship with. Well, what I will do sometimes, and speaking of art therapy, um, uh -huh. I will have them visualize it as a being. Now, what am I doing there? Well, I'm moving it from the rational world to the mythic world. Mm. The mythic world populates our lives, populates uh, our worlds with, with qualities that are personifications that then enable us to be able to relate to the contents. So, so just as a very clear example, I might say, well, you know, can you go online and find an image that you think captures how angry mm. you feel of a person Ooh. or a creature? Mm. You know, and then they'll bring it in and we'll begin working on it. And um, just that process of suddenly establishing a relationship through those means to something that seems so foreign changes everything. That just happens mm -hmm. over and over again. You know, once you make that move, and consciousness is then able to kind of say, oh, yeah, when I look at that image of my anger, I see hurt, right? Or I see grief, or I see mm -hmm. loss, you know? And, I, and, and, you know, it just brings it up. Because the psyche and imagery, imagistic processes are constellative or constellational in nature, meaning that they're always drawing together a lot of contents from a lot of different directions to create their singularity. So that's one of the ways that I, I, I may work with those things. Yeah, and one of the things it's, that uh, strikes me about that, Mark, is that you can do this work on, online. I, I mean, um, yes. you know, there's, there's been this discussion that we've been somewhat involved in since the pandemic is, you know, can you, can, can an online virtual encounter constellate all of this and, and do, do you work is your practice partially online my, my practice is primarily online now okay. um you know i've been i've been involved in a move so i'm resituating myself but um yeah i, I work primarily online okay. um I, I have a gentleman that i work with you can do it with drawing too i mean or any any kind of expression sometimes mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. as you guys know will say oh god you know there was this film you know, and there was this section where, you know, Carrie reaches up and grabs the girl at the end of the movie, you know, and, mm -hmm. and there it is, you know, and I'll say, well, let's watch it, you know, let's look at that together. I have a gentleman that I'm working with now who, you know, just had a horrific childhood, and um, 
um, you know, I, uh, he had a dream, and from the dream, uh, there was an abstract something hanging behind his back, you know, as he was watching something in the dream. And I said, bring it forward, you know, let's see what that looks like, right? And he did that, and then we went to another. It was like a Rubik's Cube or something, you know. It was something abstract. He couldn't get his, his mind around it. Um, so it was very much lodged in the feeling world, which doesn't necessarily have a form. And then I asked him to make a personification of it. And Jung says, speaking of the transcendent function, you don't have to have any ability. I can guarantee you, after many years of doing art therapy, Artistic ability and psych- psychological expression are not one and the same. Mm. You know, the simplest things by kids will blow your mind <laughs> what's in that artwork. So it, it doesn't require any skill um, you know, to do that. And what came out of this, uh, this image for this man, I think, was really important and profound in his work. No skill needed. Jung said that dreams are the guiding words of the soul. Dream School is our 12-month self-paced online program that teaches you how to understand these important messages from the unconscious. We break down the essential skills, teach you how to apply them, and offer opportunities for practice. You can become part of a vibrant community, join a dream group, or share your dream with other students. There are monthly live Q&As with Joseph, a chance for one-on-one time with Deb in her office hours, and monthly dream seminars with me, Lisa. Visit our website, thisjungianlife.com, to learn more or sign up. Well, Mark, you were leaning into this uh, thing that we see in analysis, that sometimes body sensation and feeling and image are not woven together in the psyche, and that yeah. produces a kind of suffering and symptomology. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering how you understand that separation of those things, and, and have you seen some cases that you can talk about where those things come together and how that facilitated a process? Yeah, that's a great question, Joseph. I I do have an example of what you're asking about. Um, There was a a young man that came to me uh, who insisted that he was severely mentally ill. And uh, he was of the opinion, he just graduated high school. He um, was of the opinion that his parents had sent him to me so I could convince him to go to college. Uh, I had no such agenda. I said, okay, you know. Um, I I actually didn't buy that he was seriously mentally ill. Um, I had a pretty strong intuitive sense that this was a pretty strong individual in many ways, but I didn't know what was going on. Um, He began to tell me that he had a lot of somatic disturbances. He would become nauseous, and he would... um, uh, not go outside because he was nauseous. He wasn't agoraphobic. Mm. He was uh, socially very capable, uh, a force to be reckoned with, actually. He was a, quite, a, quite a strong guy. Um, as the uh, work progressed, I kept going back and forth in, in, in a verbal manner, trying to uh, put together a, a kind of a psychological, theoretical formulation for the onset of these, uh, of these symptoms. Um, and um, uh, would, would formulate, as we always do, uh, uh, psychological formulations are also myths that we tell ourselves about what we're looking at, and that is the goal of psychological uh, theory, is that it allows us a mythic lens into what's going on. And it seemed like there, was some, there were some things that um, could, could account for these uh, symptoms. Um, But as we went along, there would suddenly be as if we had put the uh, put things together again, and a bowling ball would come hurtling down and knock the whole thing down. And I was always baffled, and so there was constantly this back and forth between: Well, is this physiological? Is this psychological? What is this? Mm. He had been to many, many, many doctors, and the doctors shook their heads: Nothing wrong with you. This is all in your head. So at that one is point, so unhelpful to people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it was, it was, and it turns out they were wrong. But um, actually, you know, in this case, what's interesting is he pushed me. He goes, "Well, you do art therapy too, don't you?" And I said, "Yeah, I do." And I had never thought 
to actually ask him to draw. A very verbal, very bright, very intelligent young man. And um, good with concepts. Um, but we did. And I had him do, uh, draw what uh, we call a scribble projective. And, and a scribble projective, mm -hmm. it's a way to get the, the unconscious contents. You scribble on the page for a period of time. And then you make associations to what you scribble. And then you ask the person to choose one of their associations and complete a drawing. That's one version of the scribble projective. Mm -hmm. And he did. And uh, it was immediate, immediately. He looked at it. And he said, you know, essentially, um, that's mm. me. That's my, that's, that, that is the part of me that's ill. Mm. And um, uh, I asked him what he felt about it. And he said he felt sad for it. He felt compassion. Before, he had felt hatred of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going back to the transcendent function, you've got a, something in the unconscious or something of which he's not aware that's part of him. And his attitude towards it is hostility and antipathy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you see. And so that's the ego attitude towards the unconscious contents. Now, Jung tells us quite clearly, the unconscious cares <laughs> about the attitude consciousness takes towards it. You know, says that that's explicitly. Right. And here what happened when he was able to look at this image of the scribble. He was able to say, this is a suffering part of me. And I have compassion for its plight. Mm. And that just opened a huge door. And we began uh, to continue with the scribbles. And what began to happen was in his world, there was a whole mm. um, cast of characters in there and a whole dynamic. The work, the artwork was just laying out what was going on in his psyche to the amazement of both of us, by the way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, I later had a dream about him that I was in my mudroom and he came in and he handed me a little bit of food and I took huh. it and ate it and it was the most delicious food I ever had in my life. Oh, wow. you know, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, Jung says, no doctor who is incapable of being changed by his patient is likely to be of much help to that patient. You know? And this guy has changed me. Uh, really irrevocably. Yeah. But to continue the story, uh, one of the things that would happen is that with the onset of his symptoms, he would become what he called the kid. And it was a little inner child that was trapped. And uh, he began, uh, the kid began writing me letters, you know, telling me about myself and telling me the things that were helpful. And uh, there was also a so monster. It was, like super, it was like supervision from the self or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it was. And, and this, this goes case. to what we're talking about, right? There was a piece of him personifying and communicating mm -hmm. what was going on. We see this in active imagination all the time, don't we? The person mm -hmm. enters the dream, somebody shows up and says, well, let me guide you here. Or, you know, mm -hmm. no, this is not what you think it is at all. This is something right. quite different. And so this kid was, was talking. So I thought I was hot on the trail. I thought, at least I've got, now I've got it, you know. It was only one problem. <laughs> there was this monstrous element in him. Mm -hmm. And the monstrous element that I tried to make contact with and have some sort of dialogue with would not talk. It did not care. It was impervious. Mm -hmm. It was going to do what it needed to do. Mm -hmm. One and of the things that would happen. Um, it was a piece of life at another level. Mm -hmm. And, and this, is, this is it. It was, it was a somatic expression, mm. uh, ultimately, of an actual illness. Mm. Um, and what happened was, um, one of the things that would happen is when he got these onsets, he would, he would break out in a sweat, he would pace around, he couldn't focus on anything else. It totally captivated him. And one night he came into my office and he, and he would always say, you know, something's terribly wrong and nobody can do anything about it. You know? Oh boy. And um, uh, I would always do the work of saying, you know, maybe there really isn't anything wrong. You know, this is me not doing the transcendent function, not listening, <laughs> you know, to what it was being brought, you know. But one night I'm sitting in my chair looking at him over on the sofa. And what do I see? 
I see the kid, you know, wow. with tears in his eyes, saying to me, something's terribly wrong and nobody will do anything about it. And suddenly my heart kind of broke. And I said, yeah, you're right. There's something mm-hmm. terribly wrong. And we really need to do something about it, wow. you know. And um, what subsequently happened was that he finally found a physician. You know, he sort of said, we, we got to find a doctor. Because what began to dawn on me was that some of his psyche was actually held captive by a somatic experience in a way mm-hmm. that was not going to be translatable mm-hmm. into psychological language. It mm-hmm. was physiological. And that we had been working with his physiological structure, which I think had grown up around this physiological issue. Turned out, uh, long story short, there was a physiological problem. It was finally discovered. And then he went through hell, (laughs) absolute hell, um, trying to ferret out and find out what this this was. There's a lot more to the story. Um, But ultimately, you know, he's doing well. He's doing well. You've created a total cliffhanger here. You've got to name what this uh, <laughs> yeah. problem was. What, what well, was it, was a, it was an disorder. autoimmune disorder that caused uh, wow. uh, an inflammatory process in him. Okay. Got this, um, this sleuth of a doctor hung in there with him and went after it doggedly and even wow. went up against a lot of other physicians wow. that said, no, this wow. isn't this diagnosis. No, you've wow. got it wrong. But the, the, he, the doctor wow. got it right and began to treat it. And so the symptoms began to abate. Now, the psychological structure resp- that he had created in himself to try to compensate yeah. for this remained. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. there was some work ongoing with beginning to dismantle this because, you know, it, to put it bluntly, this young man had been repeatedly traumatized over and over and over and over again by this. Um, Another aspect of it was he not only graduated college, Mm -hmm. he went to graduate school to become a counselor. And he (laughs) was thought by his school to be brilliant. (laughs) You know? This and I said to him, I remember saying to him, because this is the you know, this is the story of the wounded healer, right? Sure. I said, all of, your, all of your attention that has been, been inwardly focused towards, he was, he was so hypervigilant to any fluctuation in him physiologically, because he knew that what was going to happen was he was going to be clobbered by this thing. Mm-hmm. You know? And he, uh, I, I said to, remember saying to him, if you can, at some point, bring all that energy to bear towards the process of looking at other people and viewing outwardly, you'll be a force to be reckoned with. He is. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, that's, that's, that's just great. So great. Let, let, let's it required two doctors. Required two mm-hmm. doctors, actually. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. you being one of them? Yeah, I was the doctor yeah. of the soul, and the other was the doctor of the body who, who <laughs> yeah. tended to his domain, mm-hmm. and I tended to my domain. You know, mm-hmm. you know, Mercurius comes down and there's the two battling figures with their swords going at it. And here's the transcendent function in a way, yeah. you know. And I think the mistake that I made was trying to psychologize everything physiological because that was yes. my, yeah. my framework. Um, but I, I can just tell you, I mean, I, to this day, I will never forget it. You know, looking over there and actually seeing the kid, you know, just like, oh my God, you poor little kid, you know. Mm. And, and I believed him then. I yes. believed him because yes. I could see him. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that is so critically important to be mm-hmm. believed, to have yes. a person's experience simply be believed rather than interpreted or airbrushed away or mm-hmm. minimized or psychologized. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I wanted to loop back and... Uh, you know, articulate what is the wounded healer. It's um, something that I imagine every analyst in training uh, has to has to deal with. And I remember Alden Josie assigning us an essay on the wounded mm-hmm. healer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, l- let's just say what that is. Um, it, mm-hmm. Go for it, Mark. 
Well, I'll give you my understanding of it, coming from my yeah. own life as well, you know, that, that, you know, the psyche wounds us. It always, all human beings mm -hmm. get wounded mm -hmm. in the process of our becoming. Mm -hmm. And uh, those things that have uh, wounded us give rise to symptoms, give rise to pain, uh, but they also provide an opening. Uh, they also permit us to see something in a unique way. Uh, I imagine this young man, and this was the direction he was heading in when I last had contact with him, was to work with people with chronic somatic or chronic physiological mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. um, it makes sense. He knows the territory. He's done the research inside of himself. you know, And so he can bring compassion and insight into that. So the wound, the wound, uh, that the thing that wounds us also endows us as well. Yeah. And it can be the very devil trying to move from one, one to the other. It's an agonizing journey oftentimes and leads down to, I think oftentimes what we call the dark night of the soul, you know, to face that scary thing that's wounded us, to, to face the pain, you know, and to come to terms with it. Um, but that's the way I understand the wounded healer. That the wound is an is also an opening. Yes. And and when we can find that opening, yes. you know, like like your young man did, uh, then it becomes a, a portal uh, to connect with other people and to connect with in a felt, intuitive, experiential kind of transcendent function way with what's mm -hmm. going on in, in other people. Uh, yes, I mean, the alchemists say you will find it in the filth. And you know, my mm -hmm. understanding of that is you will find it in the very thing you detest and the thing that you yeah. hate and the thing you least yeah. want to touch, mm -hmm. that the gift is there, you know. And uh, again, yeah. it's, it's uh, it, you know, people, it, it, you just can't say that and everybody go, oh, great, I've been wounded, you know. <laughs> uh, what a gift, you know. Um, <laughs> Nobody wants that, but, but the reality is it's there, and I think it's really important, you know, from an analytic perspective, for us to understand that potential and hold out hope for that potential. Well, just to take a little side note for some of our listeners that not, might not be familiar, but um, also the transcendent function for Jung was his discovery that the ego and the unconscious can talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And yes. that, that things come out of that dialogue. Yes. And as you were saying, sometimes our wounds, our physical and psychological suffering, call our attention so powerfully to a place or beckon us to a place. And as the ego takes an interest in that, that interest is a kind of conversation. Yes. And if we can, um, if we have a space, as you did with your client, to, to mm -hmm. try to get words around that conversation, mm -hmm. that begins, hopefully, to slowly move things along. The scribble drawing mm -hmm. is a way of having that conversation. And I'd love for you to uh, describe that process a little bit, because I could imagine some of our listeners wanting to try it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it seems like an, a wonderful um, way to, to take a little step mm -hmm. into facilitating a, a conversation with the unconscious. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, dreams mm -hmm. are part of the, the conversation and what we might do with it. Mm -hmm. So you, you had spoken so eloquently about that. But, um, but there is a little bit of a definition around that that I think could be helpful, yeah. Yeah, well, well, thank you for that. I actually, I actually loved what you said about the transcendent function. I thought it was beautifully stated. Um, yeah, the, the conversation and the relationship are very important. You know, one of the things that art therapists always talk about is the idea of objectification. That things that are, what this means is, uh, most, of you, most of your listeners will, will know something about uh, funerary art or tombstones. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and when somebody is lost to us, they've simply disappeared, we need some physical mm -hmm. thing to have a relationship with them still. You know? And this is why you have things like tombstones. And we also need a ritual, by the way, to, to handle 
um, uh, that transition from one state to another, yeah. but that's a whole nother, another piece to this. Um, to describe the scribble projective is uh, you close your eyes for a brief period and scribble on the page and stop when you're ready. And then what I would do is I would hold up the image and I would have them look at it and say, you know, what comes to mind as you look at this like a projection, like an inkblot test. And they would give me associations and I'd write them all down. Now, I can guarantee you <laughs> that even in that process, a lot of stuff comes to the surface, right? But they'll pick one. I say, well, okay, here are, these, here are these associations. Please pick one. And then they, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do a, a little creature, is what this guy said. I'm going, well, you know, complete a picture using the scribble that if somebody came in, they'd say, I see the little creature, you know, and you can use whatever you want to fill it in. And he did. And the little creature in this drawing, he put a ground line, and underneath the ground line, he put three demons that looked like fiery demons underneath, and the little creature was scurrying away through the night, and flames were coming up under its feet, you know. How evocative is that? You know, these things down below, uh, in the unconscious, in the soma, you know, where was this down below? There's many down mm -hmm. belows, mm -hmm. but in this case, mm -hmm. I think it was largely unconscious and somatic. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then we put it up together and we look at it and I just say, what, you know, what comes to you? What do you notice? And uh, you're just asking some really simple questions like, you know, what do you, what do you see? You know, what's the narrative here? Um, what do you feel about what you're looking at? Those kinds of questions uh, are helpful. Uh, again, as with dream interpretation, and I'm sure everybody in this room has had this experience of working on your own dreams when you were early in training and banging up against the wall, and you know, because our own complexes tend to inform what we're looking at. You know, that's what a complex does. It hijacks perception. It sort of says, well, this is what's allowable to see, and this is what it should mean. And so part of the process of the analysis, or in the case of art therapy, the art therapist is to stand as the intermediary and to actually hold that there are more possibilities that the individual themselves mm -hmm. has uh, uh, the capacity, really, or the orientation to engage with. Now, that's not always the case. Uh, that's definitely not always the case. Um, um, Creative process in and of itself can reconnect people to things in quite a natural way. You don't always need the interpretive process. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I had a case with a young man, came in with some really bad behaviors. You know, his parents said, I think he's bipolar. And oh, you know, I yeah. kind of didn't want the case, you know, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. And I kind of let it lag for a while. And let me think about this. And they came back to me and petitioned to me to see this young man. And I began... Um, a project where I thought where the therapy should be directed. This was before I was in an analysis. And um, he got really frustrated with me because this isn't helping me, you know. And I said, okay, let's just do this. And so I, I initiated a drawing with him, you know, and, and, and uh, what happened was things came up in the drawing and I just said, okay, next what? What's the next drawing? And hmm. he took me on this journey Wow. for about, four months. And all I did was say, oh, well, what's going on in there? You know, he, this kid was mm -hmm. about 15, 14, 15. So what's going on in there? You know, well, what's the next thing that happens? Well, who is that? I just interviewed him about it. And the whole thing just flowed. And at mm -hmm. some point, his symptoms disappeared. And his mom comes in and says, well, we're ending therapy now. The, uh, the effects or that he's on is finally starting to work. But I said to the kid, I said, I don't think this has any, you've been on effects for a long time. Nothing's been changed. I've had so many cases like that, you know, where everybody's medicating some, you know, medical model diagnosis. This kid had some issues in terms of, mm -hmm. he was a little bit atypical neurologically. Mm -hmm. um, but he also had some issues with, uh, you know, his mother wasn't really tuned into him. I don't think she knew quite how to relate to him. Um, and, and I think what, what, as I look back, Jung says this wonderful thing. We don't know the diagnosis until the case is over. You know? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you know? yeah. And I find that to be true. You know, you've got to go, I, I really don't know yeah. what's going on here. Yeah. I think I have an idea and I'm trying to get there. But there's really something 
about the analyst's deep investment in that process mm -hmm. and caring about it, you know, that I think is huge. You know, I think that that's, that that's actually, if you look at psychotherapy research, the psychotherapy research says that. It says the, the, the greatest differential between therapies is not the type of therapy, it's the therapist. And whether or not the therapist is using a model that they authentically feel comfortable in and, mm -hmm. and believe in, mm -hmm. right? And wish to be helpful. Wish to be helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a fairy tale called The Frog King. In olden times when wishing still helped. Well, it still does. Oh. <laughs> it still does. You know, your intentionality, what you care about. And you can be wrong. I mean, I think I've just told you on a couple yeah. occasions. Yeah, I got it wrong for a while, mm -hmm. you know. Until finally I got educated by what was there, you know. Yeah, yeah. our clients educate us over oh, yeah. and over again. Yes. Uh, yes. And and the reality of psyche, of the the reality of the caring and working from a model that feels truly authentic and real. Uh, Jung says over and over again that the psyche is real. Oh, you know, and mm -hmm. it it feels like yeah, okay, right, I know that um, psyche's mm -hmm. real. Okay, next. <laughs> but that it has a direction and a purpose of its own, and mm -hmm. it is autonomous. Mm -hmm. And if we can't connect with, with that, how do we help our client connect with it in himself or herself? Yes, it, 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 there's always a struggle, I, I think, at least I'm speaking mm -hmm. personally, maybe, maybe not for you guys, but mm -hmm. there's always a struggle within me to get out of my preconceptions, no matter how well-meaning they are, yeah, you know, and, and, and to finally open up uh, to kind of what's there, you know, and mm -hmm. to be able to relate to it and to be, uh, to invert the process of being the person that knows to being the person who's taught, mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and, you know, what you said, Deb, is true, you know, he says um, that the psyche is purposive is a principle of a concept of the highest heuristic value. It is so true. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. so true. Mm -hmm. And to, to, to mm -hmm. move a little bit, this is kind of what Gebser's talking about. He's saying, you know that capacity for us to listen to nature, right, and be affected by nature rather than dominate nature? That's still in us. It's really important. Yeah. You know, um this is a little bit of a dog leg turn, but uh, I know that that story about the Frog King has been really important to you. And mm -hmm. I am wildly curious about uh, how that is and what that is. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you say something about that and maybe give us a, a quick overview of the story too, uh, 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 the Reader's Digest version? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, the story, uh, you know, everything, um, let me begin in a strange place. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, <laughs> that sounds <yay>. great. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes say that to my clients. I know this is going to sound crazy, but you know, bear with me for a minute. You know, in, in Jung's introduction, his foreword to the, the I Ching, mm -hmm. he says, well, you know, the Western mind sectorizes encapsulates, quantifies everything. Mm -hmm. He says that was not true of the mind that created the I Ching, which in the image of the very moment that you're in, all the little details mm. are interrelated and important. Mm. So, so what I would say, just to, as, a, as a broad concept, the image of the moment can only be understand, understood imagistically by which I mean as a complete whole in which all the little details line up according to some principle. Now, uh, I wrote my, my dissertation for my a an analytic uh, degree on the, um, I, I called it Instances and Aspects of Image, a fairy tale example. Mm -hmm. And my point wasn't an interpretation of the fairy tale. My point was to look at the moves happening in the fairy tale as moves of psyche. Von Franz, Marie-Louise von Franz, famous Jungian analyst, massively brilliant, 
has written volumes on fairy tales, and it, I, you know, <laughs> I can't match that. But I did my own journey through it, uh, as much to educate myself and wake up myself to what was there. It was more of a, dis- a voyage of discovery into the fairy tale. Uh, the fairy tale be, uh, really operates for most of the fairy tale on what I would call a vertical axis. If you look at the fairy tale, it begins with the son, with the king, and his daughters. And there's three daughters, right? And, and it's the youngest daughter. So you have this hierarchy, right? The celestial golden okay. orb that provides a bowl mm-hmm. over all. And then you have the king, who is the sun on earth personified. And the ruler, so that's the rule. But he doesn't have a wife, and there's no suitor. So how's the kingdom going to continue? We don't know the answer to that. Um, there's the incest taboo, right? You know, this isn't going to be happening. There aren't going to be, there's not going to be King Jr. coming along. Um, now, the fairy tale says something really remarkable. Uh, it says, when the days were hot, the princess would go down by the linden tree and sit by a well, you know, to cool off. Well, psychologically, what we understand that is there's too much heat. (laughs) Mm. And she's trying to escape the heat that's up there with the king and the sun. And she's heading down towards darkness. Now, what do we extract as a principle from that? We can extract a principle from that. Jung calls it entropy. That when there's an imbalance in the psyche, the psyche will try to rebalance itself. Mm. And so here is the princess trying to find a balance. And she goes down to the darkness. A linden tree is a shade tree. The well isn't up, it's down. It's not Mm -hmm. light, Mm -hmm. it's dark. Mm -hmm. And it's Mm -hmm. cold. It's not fire, it's water. It's in the earth, not the sky. So we see the eternal play of opposites happening in this fairy tale. And what, what happens? Well, she loves her golden ball, but mm-hmm. somehow, mysteriously, the thing she most <sighs> values falls into the well. There mm-hmm. is psychological teleology. There is the psyche mm-hmm. saying, you know that thing you care most about? Guess what? Say goodbye. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. it's, it, it's psyche's move. It's the thing that's incidental. And people don't stop and think about it in their lives, right? It's like, well, this thing just happened. Well, we know in looking at this grand imagistic drama that's unfolding, that even these incidental things that happen in the lives of us and our analysands are part of Psyche's process. So she drops the wall down the well, and what happens? Uh, Well, she immediately has feeling. She screams and cries and wails. And what happens? Life from down below comes a-calling. And the frog comes up and says, What's the matter, little princess? You know, and so, you know, we go from there and she makes a deal with the devil, the frog, the thing she least likes and least, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's living nature is what the frog is at that point, right? It's, it's an expression of living nature. And we just look at the frog symbolism and frogs are amphibious, right? They're highly procreative, you know, Mm -hmm. and, you know, they're, they're the antithesis of what she would want. So they're metamorphs too, you know, they, they mm-hmm. start off as little eggs, they become tadpoles and they come up on the side and they come up on the land. So, f- and the frogs know how to move from one realm to another. Right. And sure enough, after she makes a deal with the frog, she says, forget about it, I'm out of here. And she goes back up mm-hmm. to the king. <laughs> and of course, the fro- now we've, we've gone down the axis and now we're going back up the axis, right? There's a structure here in the psyche. And, and she goes up and, and, you know, there's this knocking on the door and she goes to the door and the frog's there and says, little princess, I thought we had a deal, right? You know, and she slams the door in fright and runs back to the king who's sitting at the table. And the king says, what's wrong? It seems like you've seen a giant. Because actually that's the way her psyche sees the frog, as if it's massive and dangerous, right? But she knows and we know that they have a destiny with one another. And that, mm-hmm. speaking of the transcendent function, is the conflict says, you have a destiny with something in the unconscious. It's coming calling for you, mm-hmm. and you're going to have mm-hmm. to meet it. Right? You know, the analyst knows this, you know, at least in principle, doesn't know the outcome. You're quite right. What's going to happen? We have no idea how this is going to come, come out. So she, um, you know, she's always just a nasty frog, and she tells the king that she made a deal, and the 
king says, you know, you made a deal. You need to kind of stick with mm-hmm. it. Here, the ruler is sticking to the rule. So she sticks with the deal, brings him in, and he actually eats from her golden plate, you know, with her. It means they, you know, the, finally the frog and she are eating from the same plate. You know, how symbolic, you know, we're both, we're, we're on an equal level. So it comes time to go up to bed, and she carries the frog up. The king says, you know, you need to go up there. And what does she do? The little princess becomes an actual animal, a murderous animal. Mm. She suddenly becomes instinctual. She mm-hmm. slams the frog against the wall. And as soon as the frog hits the wall, he becomes human. There's a, there's a mutual enantiodromia, right? There's a mm-hmm. mutual coming together of what was always hidden in each one of them, meaning that inside the frog, there was a latent humanity. He felt for her. Mm. He cared about her. Mm-hmm. He was relatable. That's what he wanted, relationship. Right. She, on the other hand, was human, but cold, not accepting, too pristine, not instinctual. Right? And so there's a mutual uh, coming together mm. uh, because they both are transformed in that moment. Right? And, then, and then suddenly, if you look at the fairy tale, you realize it's now on a horizontal axis, not on a vertical axis. Suddenly, they're now being drawn by eight white horses, and they're chained. There's the gold chaining them to the carriage, and they're going off. And then the dream ends with the feeling function, you know, uh, who is sitting and tending to the whole process that feeling was important. There are so many things in that fairy tale. And one of the concepts I would like to put forward is, is as remarkable as that fairy tale is, they're all remarkable. Yes. And so are all of our dreams. Yes. Uh, each fairy tale, I would say, is an organ of perception, meaning that each one is a doorway into understanding the moves of the psyche, mm-hmm. uh, each and every one of them. And so, actually, so is scripture. You know, so are the great mm-hmm. religions, if we can look at them properly. They are portraits of the soul in action, mm-hmm. and so are the dreams. It's beautiful. So um, really I just beautiful. I just learned so much. I mean, I, I I I think I just barely squeaked by graduating with that. Um, I I got I got uh, passing with distinction on my cases, which I didn't expect. But then I got clobbered over my thesis. But uh, you know, I have to say, the real gift of the thesis wasn't the product of the work; it was the process of writing it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's beautiful. I love, I love what you said about fairy tales. I couldn't agree more. I love that fairy yeah. tale in particular, and that's included yeah. in, in my new... And I'm almost thinking, gosh, we should have you back and just spend the whole time talking about that fairy tale. Oh, with, I would love Oh, wow. Me. I would love we should, that. We should do that again soon. I, I think the happily ever after ending uh, here is how many portals there are uh, into the wisdom of psyche, into mm-hmm. the wisdom of the unconscious. Uh, that there are, re- you know, what we call religious texts. There are fairy tales. There are dreams. There is image. There is art therapy. Mm-hmm. There, there are. It's there. It's accessible. Mm-hmm. It's waiting mm-hmm. for us. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, if we can just shift our vision enough uh, to see what is right in front of us as age-old wisdom, as mm-hmm. image, as, as uh, the list is really quite, quite extensive. You're, uh, you're, and, um, and you've made it, you know, really mm-hmm. much more readily available um, mm-hmm. this morning. Yeah, this has been an extraordinary conversation. I feel like we could just go on talking, but I think we need to switch to a dream. So before we switch to a dream, Mark, I'm imagining some of our listeners might be interested in getting in touch. And uh, are you accepting new analysands? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Be happy to see. And what's, sure. what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Uh, the best way to get a hold of me would probably be just be my email. Um, okay. which I think you guys can post online, but do you want me to give it verbally? Yeah, I wanted you to go ahead and say it. Yeah, it's going to be my name, M-A-R-K-D-E-A-N, the number two, at M-A-C dot com, markdean2 at mac dot com. And before we transition into a dream, I would love to tell people about Dream School. 
that we have a program online which we've designed with you in mind to help people keep a dream journal and really carefully and meticulously unpack the secret messages that the dream maker is providing for you. That there is something deep and profound inside of you that is trying to reach out, trying to help, trying to illuminate important things. So if you go to our website, thisunionlife.com, click on Dream School, we have a wonderful informative page where you can take a look at that offering and hopefully we'll see you there. So with that, we'll transition to a dream. Uh, today's dreamer is a woman. She's 53, and she's a psychotherapist, writer, and storyteller uh, who has titled her dream, The Belly of the Whale. And here's the dream. I am in the upper level of a shopping center with a man who seems to be recently released from some kind of jail or lockup. He's tall, lanky, bedraggled, and unworldly. I am tasked to take him somewhere in the center, but we keep getting trapped in a department store amongst high-end fashion labels that seem outrageously colorful and ridiculous, almost Alice in Wonderlandy. I try to take him down a level, but the man can't navigate the escalator and we find ourselves outside on the deck of a lavish swimming pool. Both of us are in the pool, and a freak wave takes me under. I am stuck underwater. There is a ledge above me, stopping me find the surface, panicking. Then I realize not only can I breathe, but I'm in a cavernous room, and a woman sits opposite me. I say, how long have you been here? And she says, six months. Welcome to the belly of the whale. I realize the walls are pink and indeed I'm inside a whale. I ask her why she hasn't tried to escape through the blowhole and she leans forward, head in her hands, passive, resigned, given up. Then I wake. And for context, she says that she's currently moving house and recently realized that her calling to be a storyteller is stronger than that of a therapist. And she adds that in the dream, there was a feeling of letting that man down, terror that the surface of the water is blocked by the rock shelf, awe inside the whale, and a sense that there is a way out of there. Uh, she also adds that she has no interest in fashion and that where she lives, whales are currently migrating. So with all that. Before we start working we on thinking? this dream, I just want to say, I want to share my repeated awe whenever I encounter a dream. <laughs> I mean, what you just read, it's so... <laughs> It's so beautiful. It's so full of mystery. Mm -hmm. It's so full of life. I have no idea what it means. But I marvel at the psyche's ability to produce these products, that the ego could mm -hmm. never create something like this. And I think it's just sort of an example of the territory you took us into, Mark, like the incredible creativity of the unconscious. Even, even, mm -hmm. before, even before we know what this dream means, I just stand in awe of it. I, I think the awe is, um, you know, people, I, I, I talk to therapists all the time, they're burnt out. I'm like, well, I'm not, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is always just that experience. It's like, my God, how do such right. things get created? And you will find, as I found, uh, not only in the dream world, but the art therapy world in, in general, when the psyche speaks, it's precise. Yes. Yeah, yes. it's precise. Dreams are it's, it's very not, precise. Yeah, it's not random. It's not a mistake. It's not an aberration. It is spot on. We can't always 
nail it down because the, mm. the language is really sometimes well beyond us. But boy, the things we get to are stunning. Yeah. And that's why with a dream, it's so important to pay attention to the precise image that the psyche mm-hmm. has supplied. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for the setting, we're in a shopping center. Uh, I I think about the upper level. She's on the upper level, uh, sort of like I'm thinking back to the frog prince, Mm -hmm. the upper level versus down in the well, but upper level of a shopping center and maybe a little bit of a psychic play on words of something uh, at the center uh, with an opposite sex person who uh, seems to be newly released from some kind of jail. So Mm -hmm. something has been liberated. Um, Although this image of the man is, you know, it's not all good to go. He's tall, lanky, bedraggled, and unworldly, Mm -hmm. but newly released into a center at the upper level. And you also have this, this image, even though the dreamer doesn't necessarily identify with high style and fashion, between <laughs> the bedraggled man, you know, his demeanor, mm-hmm. and this would-be shopping for a nicer image. Yeah. You know? mm. Yeah. Well, and I think about, um, you know, a shopping center has that, the word center in it, as you pointed out, Deb, yes. and it can be a mm-hmm. kind of cornucopia. But it can also be a place of collective values. I'm thinking back to what mm-hmm. you were saying in the in uh, initial part of our conversation today, Mark. It's, yeah. it's a place yeah. where we go to kind of find a suitable persona that might be very influenced by the spirit of the times rather than the yes. spirit of the depths. Um, so we don't know more. The dreamer didn't say more about her uh, feelings about shopping centers. So we're just kind of reaching for the dominance here. But I... I think both of those things are included. Well, she did give us a, a lovely clue, and I'd like to digress just a little bit to circle back around. Mm-hmm. Because what I said was um, that, that a, a complex or a piece of psyche will organize itself around a central dominant principle. In other words, mm-hmm. something in the psyche will say, this is the most important value, and I'm going to organize myself around it. What's interesting is what the dreamer told us is that's not what she's about. You know, right. She's not about right. that center. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. And she has a task. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh She's kind of tasked to get him out of this uh, persona-driven world. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm picking up, too. This, uh, this next line here about, um, we keep getting trapped in a department store. I just can't help but go back to a quote from Rumi. You keep heading out on the ways, but you keep stopping off at mean-spirited roadhouses, you know? Mm. <laughs> and there's a way sometimes it's so easy that we're on our journey to get sucked into being stuck again, you know. It's lovely. What I was paying attention to is that she's tasked uh, to take him down a level and that, you know, there's such an image of descent Mm -hmm. here that they start out at the upper level, but he can't navigate the escalator. So, so then the down is when they are in the pool, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, under the, and she is under the water. Mm-hmm. So this is really going down. Yeah. Right. And There's of a, course, yeah. this brings to mind the imagery from the alchemical text of the Rosarium that yeah. Jung wrote about in uh, The Psychology of the Transference, to be, to be in the bath to be in the pool together, to be in the same uh, psychological place of uh, sort of soaking in the unconscious, as it were. We both mm-hmm. descended, and there's a kind of abasement. Yeah. 
I'd like to add in just to one little detail here that catches me, and it goes back to what I said about Gene Gebser. And he talks about the mental structure of consciousness, the mythical structure of consciousness, and the magical structure of consciousness. Um, I see a hint of a movement into the magical structure of consciousness mm. with when she says, almost Alice in Wonderland. Mm. It's a movement from the idea of the temporal world into one that is more magical. And one of the things that's difficult to, to, to explain all this here, but in fact, it's one of the reasons why we do move into these kinds of magical places and these mythical places, because transformation in, inwardly is not going to happen on the level of merely moving around different fashions outwardly. It's going to be more of a mythical, magical world that we're going to enter into. Hmm. Well, one of the lenses that I'm just going to toss on all of this is the uh, rosarium. Mm -hmm. So we start with a male and a female. The male has just been released from some kind of a jail. The woman who is in the belly of the whale is trapped in some kind of a jail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The man and the woman are taken into a pool, which is central in the rosarium. When she and the man finally get in the pool, the ego's main attitude is, can't we get out of here? Mm -hmm. So what I see is the central difficulty is that she's been tasked to have some kind of a relationship with this, what might be anonymous figure, that somehow is rather unappealing. He's bedraggled. He looks like he's you know an ex-convict. <laughs> um, he's strange and otherworldly, but mm -hmm. something that she doesn't quite know has said, You've, you have to be on some kind of a journey. There's something to be done between the two of you. And at the end, what we see is that the dream ego and the feminine that, that is in the pool, the feminine is trapped and waiting. The ego really wants to get, get out of all of this. So if this... If I was to do a really quick um, piece on this, I would go into this question of what is the relationship with the animus? What is unappealing mm -hmm. about that such that the salutio doesn't seem like something creative, but more something that's a trap? And how might that in, in some way be evident in, in what she's struggling with, although we don't know that. We know she's in a transition from being a therapist into being a storyteller. Um, so there's something ab about this resistance, I think, in the dream that I would be interested in highlighting. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a lovely observation. I w would also add, however, that it's interesting that she's, she's able to get into the submerged place and, mm -hmm. and survive. You know, she, she learns that even though she goes into submergence, she can survive it, no matter what the, what the concern is about the whale. Yeah. You know, I, I'm going back to the myth, the story, uh, because it's so blatantly obvious, of Jonah and the whale. <laughs> and uh, Jonah was swallowed by the whale because he refused to do God's bidding. God sent, God sent him off to preach in Nineveh, which was the cap capital of the Assyrian uh, kingdom. And the Assyrians were, uh, you know, from uh, the Hebrew point of view, ungodly people, and they were pretty ferocious. So Jonah, uh, sensibly enough, didn't want to go gets on a boat going uh, away from Nineveh, get me out of mm -hmm. here, uh, uh, not, not doing that. And um, then when he's on ship, the storm comes, and uh, the sailors say, well, you know, this is somebody's fault. And Jonah says, yeah, sorry, guys, it's on me, and uh, asks to be tossed overboard. So the first thing is that he does take responsibility for being the cause of the storm, which is evidence of God's wrath. Uh, and then he's swallowed by the whale. So if I, um, 
you know, take that into this dream, I think about, uh, is there a Nineveh in this woman's life that she was Mm -hmm. or is kind of supposed to, in quotes, uh, go to and has refused? Mm -hmm. And that in the dream, the dream ego is the one that says, hey, look, you know, why don't you uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and try to get out through the blowhole? But that's not how you get out of the belly of the whale. Mm, mm. The way uh, something else, uh, you know, in the story, uh, God takes the whale, of course, right to Nineveh, and uh, vomits Jonah up on the shore, where he, uh, where he goes and preaches very successfully in Nineveh. Mm-hmm. They're all mm-hmm. very receptive. So I wonder if something else has to happen. Uh, to liberate our dream ego from the belly of the whale, which is sort of a depressive place with the woman yeah. inside being passive, mm-hmm. resigned, giving up. Uh huh. Well, and you do have to kind of resign yourself to the Lord's will, right? Or the, the will of the self in psychological mm-hmm. language. Yeah. I also love, Deb, that when Jonah pops out of the whale, <laughs> he's the storyteller. You know, he's oh, the preacher. That's great. That's great, Joseph. <laughs> he's out there preaching. That's preaching great. The stories. Um, you know, he's not writing books or doing therapy. He's uh, yeah. writing the news. That's right. He has a story to tell of here is the one true faith, um, so to speak. And uh, everyone is really receptive because his voice is now authentic, mm-hmm. having been infused with the power that this you know, awful experience has given him, but now he really knows. Yeah. Uh, He's not operating from ego about this is the right religion and here's what I need to tell you. Uh, This is really, he knows it in his his Mm -hmm. guts now. Mm -hmm. So when we come to the anonymous image that had just been released from a lockup, tall, lanky, bedraggled, unworldly, kind of looks like Jonah. (laughs) <laughs> probably did when he popped out of the whale after that terrible yeah. digestive experience. Not, not looking, looking so not great. looking good, no. Not, probably does, yeah. in fact, need some new clothes. Um, so <laughs> in a way, with, with your amplification, is that a foreshadowing mm-hmm. of um, how she's going to come out of whatever this storytelling adventure is, perhaps looking bedraggled, uh, needing some support? And and I have an intuition, Joseph, that that you just helped me make, which is that, you know, the task is to descend, Mm -hmm. but she may not fully understand what that means because she thinks it means Mm -hmm. going down to the ground floor. So Mm -hmm. it might mean, uh, okay, I think I have to get more practical here. I think I have to get more grounded in reality. I think I have to come down to earth. But in fact, the descent that's required is more of a spiritual descent into the water and into the belly of the whale. So it seems like she didn't do the right task by taking him to the pool, but in fact, that's where she needed to go. And I, I'm thinking, Mark, about your experience with, with uh, being a painter and, and mm. having great success, but just sort of you know, having this knowledge that that's not, that's not the thing you were, that was not the task. You had misunderstood the task. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I sometimes have an analogy that I call the bowl analogy, the marble in the bowl analogy that I share with some of my analysands. And I said, you know, as egos, we keep trying to put the marble of ourself on the lip of the bowl, but it keeps rolling to the center, you know? Mm. Uh. You know? And I, th- I think that's part of what maybe we're talking about here, the common denominator in, in my life and uh, maybe in this woman's life, perhaps, that, you know, mm. that, uh, you know, we do keep stopping off at mean-spirited roadhouses and sort of missing the turns and missing Psyche's messages to us. And mm-hmm. um, we are then compelled. <laughs> you know, the Psyche has its own specific gravity and it's going to draw you where you need to go. Mm-hmm. Can I bring in a quote, another quote from Rumi? Sure. Yeah. There is one thing in this world you must never forget to do. If you forget everything else and not this, there's nothing to worry about. But if you remember everything else and forget this, then you will have done nothing in your life. It's as if a king has sent you to some country to do a task, 
and you perform a hundred other services, but not the one he sent you to do. Mm -hmm. So human beings come to this world to do particular work. That work is the purpose, and each is specific to the person. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's just beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Joseph's uh, amplification that he brought um, made me think of the Syriac tale of the hymn of the pearl, mm -hmm. right? And what you're talking mm -hmm. about, Lisa, and, and the, the royal robe of Gnosis. In the tale, the, the, the young man is tasked with going down to Egypt, the land of the unclean, and he has to get the pearl of great price from the snorting serpent that lies there, you know. And he goes down and he totally forgets about his task. He assimilates to the Egyptians, and then finally he gets a message, oh, no, you need to complete this task. And he does it, and he comes back, and he actually does get the fancy clothes. He gets the royal robe of Gnosis that is glittering mm. and beautiful, you know. So it's interesting, this idea of the, the guy who sounds like a disheveled beggar and this like, contrast with the potential for wearing these kinds of really amazing clothing. So it's a really curious element in the dream. That's great. Yeah. This is fun. I enjoy this. You guys are great. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to talk to you, Mark. And uh, I'm glad we had an opportunity to have you on the podcast and introduce your fine work to our group mm -hmm. of listeners. Yeah. Well, thank yeah, you. This has been very really great to work. all of you. Thank this you so much. A lot of fun to mix with you guys again and do this stuff. <laughs> Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.